The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Tom Collins. The war changed many things, the face of the earth and the people on it. Before the war, Frank Race worked as an attorney, but he traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS. And when it was over, his former life was over, too. Adventure had become his business. The Adventures of Frank Race. And now we join Frank Race for The Adventure of the Juvenile Passenger. evening had been a turkey. Following a dull dinner, I'd been collared by my hostess, a woman with about as much depth as a waiting pool. The conversation had been a three-hour filibuster, with me affecting my escape only after a farewell scene that would have odorized any little theater in the land. So now I was settling into bed with a sigh of relief. The windows were open, the light was out, I could call it a... No. Yes... Well, about time you got home. Where you been? Well, let's not talk about that. What do you want? I'll be parking a cab in front of your place in about five minutes. Will you come down? For heaven's sakes, why? I got trouble, Race. I need your help. No, I'll bring your trouble up here. I'm in bed. That's just it. I can't. You got to come down, Race. I need you. Oh, uh, we'll make it ten minutes. <laughs> It better be good. So take a gander back there. Huh? Well, it's a girl. Yeah. And how old would you say she was? Fourteen, possibly. All right. She's fourteen and riding around in my cab at one o'clock in the morning. She ain't got the dough to pay her fare, and she says she'll kill herself if I don't keep driving her. Hmm. That ain't a ladle of trouble I'll put in with you. It'll do. What's your name, dear? I don't care to say. How long has she been riding with you, Mark? Since eleven o'clock. How'd you happen to pick her up? I didn't. I step into a cafe for a few minutes to lap up a cup of coffee. When I come out, there she is, already in the cab. Hmm. I tried to head for a precinct house once, but she put the necks on it. She knows New York as well as I do. Well, let's all go for a ride. Drive around, Mark. I'll talk to her. You could tell me your first name. That wouldn't give anything away. It's Mary. <laughs> Look, no use being mad at me. I'm a stranger. I'm not mad. It's... I'm... <laughs> Trouble at home? I don't live at home. Relatives? I stay at an orphanage. Nothing wrong with that. No, there's nothing wrong with it except... Well, how would you like it if someone were trying to send you to jail? Someone at the orphanage? Just the head of it, that's all. No one can send you to jail if you haven't done anything wrong. She claims I steal things. I I don't, but... What's the use? You won't believe me either. I believe you. I'd like to help you. You can't do anything. Nobody can do anything. What are you supposed to have stolen? Some jewelry. You like jewelry? Sure I like it. All girls do. But I didn't take any, even if they did find it in my mattress. Well, then tell them so. Well, let me take you back. No. Well, you can't keep riding around in this cab all night. Oh, nobody wants to help me. Nobody. I said I'll help you, and I will. <laughs> oh, forget about going back to the orphanage. But you must have friends, someone with whom you can spend the night. Then, tomorrow... I don't know anyone. Except Pharaoh Gillis. I'm afraid a man won't do. Oh, oh Ferris Gillis is a lady. She's swell. She came to the orphanage a couple of times and told me to come and see her any time I wanted to. You know where she lives? We could find it in the phone book. We found it in the phone book. An apartment hotel in the 60s, a place called the Wellington Arms, where the lady we sought seemed to be out. But we didn't exactly draw a blank. While we were still pushing the buzzer to her apartment on the second floor... The elevator clicked to a stop, and three men got out. We drew their instant attention. Looking for somebody? 
He could have been the kid who takes your ticket to the theater. Skin was clear. He hadn't been shaving very long. He wore a bow tie and a pork pie hat, but his voice matched his eyes. And his eyes had all the warmth of wet pebbles. You heard me. You can turn off that look of inspection. I ain't liking it. We came to see Farrell Gillis. Who's the kid? Her name's Mary. Mary what? What difference does it make? It, it's all right. I'll tell him. It, it's Leonard. Mary Leonard. Reads like an act to me. Vinny, you and Lou take him down to the car. Fogel might want to look at him. I'll go through the apartment. You may as well all go through the apartment. The youngster and I are going down by ourselves. What are you trying to do, act hard? I figure you ought to go downstairs with the boys. What do you want, a written invitation? I just want to be understood, clearly. I have an automatic in my pocket. I'm gripping it. Take the elevator, Mary. Get down to the cab. Tell Mark I may be able to use him. Scoop. All right. You don't think you're going to make me stick to you? I'm willing to try. What's the matter, Vinny? Need a smoke? Keep your hands where they are. You can wait. You know, I figure you do have an iron in that pocket. Clever of you. But I'm figuring something else, too. You didn't expect to run into us, either. Who'd want to? So I'm betting the iron ain't loaded. You go to a lot of trouble, don't you? Why don't you relax, boy? We're strangers. We've never seen each other before. If we just nod, go our respective ways, we'll both stay happy. Now I'm sure you ain't got that gun loaded. He had me. And here was a boy who plainly liked violence for its own sake. There's nothing left for me but the stairwell, so I vaulted the banister and... Got a decent fall. Hey, what goes? I was just coming up. Come in. Let's go. Where to? To that orphanage. This youngster's taken up enough of our time tonight. There were cars parked in front of the orphanage. The lights still on inside. In the office, a sort of conference seemed to have taken place. But we got an instantaneous reaction from a woman of about 50. A woman whose face suggested that she wanted no fun out of life and resented anyone else trying for it. Well, just where have you been, young lady? Who is this, Mary? Mrs. Barkley. She's head matron. Good evening, Mrs. Barkley. Well? My name's Race. I'm a private investigator. I'm acting on this young lady's behalf. Gosh. You are, are you? Well, I'll have you know... Uh, Pardon me, Mrs. Barkley. Now, where did you find this girl, Mr. Reyes? I have a friend who drives a taxi. Mary was one of his fares tonight. And she seemed upset, and he found a problem. So he called on me. I see. I don't believe we've met. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Paul Westerhaven. This is Miss Doris Sanford. Possibly you know Winthrop Gravel. Everyone does. Paul Westerhaven plays polo the way Stan Musial plays baseball. Horses and money. Plenty of both. Doris Sanford I'd never seen before. A definite loss on my part. She was lovely even under the glare of a light that gave Mrs. Barkley's face the look of a boiled potato. If you were any kind of a sharpshooter, Winthrop Gravel was a name to flinch at. He scribed a hard-hitting newspaper column that went in for reform. You might be interested to know, Race, that we're here because of this girl's disappearance. She's utterly incorrigible. We've been able to do absolutely nothing with her. You ever try being kind? Oh. Well, it is somewhat of a problem, Race. This is the second time the girl has run off. We've been fortunate that no bad publicity has developed. Now, where does Farrell Gillis fit into the picture? Oh, that woman. Who is Farrell Gillis? Well, she's rather well-known, Paul. Operates as a gambler. As far as I'm concerned, she's a pretender and a liar. Why do you have that opinion? A month or so ago, Miss Gillis promised to donate the cost of a new building for the orphanage. She seemed quite enthusiastic at the time, but nothing came of it. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to say goodnight. I'll come and see you tomorrow, Mary. We'll talk this over. All right. And if I've seemed abrupt, Mrs. Barkley, I apologize. I don't imagine your job is a breeze by any means. <clears throat> Certainly isn't. The next morning, I went back to the apartment hotel that housed Farrell Gillis... The manager, a pink-skinned man with a mouth that puckered as he talked, was still agog over the shot that had been fired the night before, but didn't connect me with it. When I mentioned Farrell Gillis, he puckered and shook his head. Uh, no, uh, she hasn't been here for a week. Uh, she often goes away like that, but never tells us where. Well, know anyone else who might know where she is? Uh, no one. She's a very strange woman. Gambles, you know. How about a lawyer? I don't believe she has one. 
You know where she banks? She doesn't. I know that for a fact. Everything in cash with Miss Gillis. It's an idiosyncrasy of hers. Always carries cash. It pays us in cash, pays everyone in cash. It must be a gambling instinct. You yeah, quite like me. Well, thanks. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Ace. Uh, uh, didn't you say you were an investigator? Yes. Well, I, I'm always willing to help investigators. Always. <laughs> The house in which Doris Sanford lived had the look that spells lots of family background, the size that spells money. I was curious to know if Miss Sanford would appear as lovely by daylight as she had the night before. She did, and then some. I can say one thing. You don't look as grim as you did last night. It was a rough evening. <laughs> you care for a drink? Oh, it was a little early. I'd rather wait. Oh, you have a charming house. Makes a nice frame for you. You couldn't pay me a nicer compliment. Oh, you? yes, I could. It was just a warm-up shot. You know, you couldn't have looked grim last night. Uh, speaking of the orphanage, I've just come from there. I had a talk with a kid. She isn't very happy. I know. We've got to do something for her. How about that Barkley lady? Oh, she's all right. She lost her sister last month, and they were very close. She's making a bit of an adjustment. She'll get over it. She seems to be adjusting at the expense of that kid. How does a woman like Farrell Gillis tie in with the orphanage? Well, it seems that she stayed there as a child. She comes in every once in a while for a visit. You know, this building she was going to have to write. How much was it going to cost? $50,000. Nice bundle of money. It is. But you can see Mrs. Barclay's side of it. She was pretty excited at the prospect. But that drink you mentioned, uh, couldn't we have it somewhere tonight? And dinner to go with it? Sounds as though it might be fun. But... But you have another engagement. I could break it. Couldn't I? <laughs> I like the way you say that. Will you call for me? With my hair combed and my face a shine. <laughs> All right, Ray. It's a date. Well, what have you been doing, shop? Oh, hello, Mike. I didn't know you were here. Well, after last night, I thought you'd be home early, so I came up. What'd you buy? A black felt hat for evening wear. I thought you had one of them. I do. But when I pulled it out today, I found a bullet hole in it. Huh? wonder where you got that. Hey, uh, a guy called about 15 minutes ago. A fellow by the name of Tully. Tully? Yeah. Oh, he's the uh, manager of the Wellington Arms. Yeah, that's the one. Said to tell you Pharaoh Gillis is back. Does that sound important? It might be. I've still got a couple of free hours, Mark. Uh, drive me over there, will you? I found the door to the apartment slightly ajar, so I knocked. I thought I heard a voice say, come in, so I did. She was reclining on a divan, a woman of perhaps 60. She had a theatrical look. Skin was heavy with makeup, her hair tinted a flamboyant red. She was smiling at me, and the set of her features indicated that she was used to smiling. There was only one thing wrong with the picture. Someone had stabbed a knife into her chest. She was dead. We'll return to the adventures of Frank Race in just about one minute. And now, back to the adventures of Frank Race. Finding someone murdered always presents one serious problem. Should you notify the police? If you do, you're going to find yourself involved. If you don't, you may find yourself even more involved. But this time, I didn't have to carry out my decision. Just as I picked up the phone, a voice spoke to me in the same soft tones that had invited me into the room. I wouldn't do that if I were you. He'd stepped out from behind a bookcase partition, and dapper serves as a one-word description. He could have been something from a style page in Esquire. He even had the leer to go with it. With him was Slate... The lad who had caused me to vault into the stairwell. The hood called Vinnie was also along. I'm Johnny Fogel, 
The lady is a friend of mine. If we're going to discuss the lady, we may as well get into the past tense, uh, don't you think? Yeah, you see, Johnny, you're sugar cookie, like I told you. You ain't going to get nowhere with him unless you raise a few lumps on him first. Were you a friend of the lady? Well, to my knowledge, this is the first time I've ever laid eyes on him. Maybe I should have said the lady was a partner of mine. I understand she was in an interesting business. The most interesting business there is. A few weeks ago, she made a killing, a real big killing. Yes? I gave her the tip that clicked for her, so I sort of figure that now she's gone. Lord rest her soul. I'm straight in line to be the heir to what she left behind. Now, I suppose that's a logical pattern of reasoning for a person of your temperament. Talk so Johnny can get what you mean. Never mind, Slate. I get what he means, and I think he gets what I mean. Let's not waste each other's time for... Don't them. reach for that phone, pal. You ain't going to call nobody. Frisk him, Slate. Ah, I wouldn't worry none, Johnny. He's got a gun, but it's never loaded. I'd take it just the same and keep it for you, Chuck. You see, Race? It's like this. You coming in here made it kind of embarrassing. A little embarrassing for us, more embarrassing for you. Because it ain't going to be sensible for me to let you go walking out, is it? You want something, Fogel? What is it? Pharaoh's dough. I happen to know she was healed with better than 50 grand. And by the way every drawer in the apartment seems to have been so neatly emptied, I'd say you'd been looking for it. Pharaoh wouldn't have been keeping the dough here. She wasn't that kind. I haven't the slightest idea what Pharaoh Gillis was like. You may as well know that I can't tell you a thing about her money. Uh, that's the trouble with you guys. You always want to play a lone hand. Let's get him out of here, Slate. Start moving, Race. And this time, you ain't getting away with no phony moves. The Slate pushed me past the door. Fogel lingered for a last look at Pharaoh Gillis, which meant that Slate and I started downstairs by ourselves. He insisted on walking right behind me, so after about six steps, I simply sat down in front of him. He instantly went over me and oh! crashed on the landing below. I leaped after him, but there was only time to regain my pistol before Fogel appeared at the top of the stairs. Drop that gun, Race! <laughs> I went the rest of the way on the run, past a gaping manager in the foyer, up to a gaping Mark Donovan at curbside. Oh, not again. Every time you go in that place, you get chased out by bullets. Get me home in a hurry, Mark. I'm due to pick up a most attractive girl in less than 30 minutes. Candlelight. Why? I might have known you'd do it this way, Race. I couldn't think of you in any other surroundings. Not at this time, anyway. You're nice. You're beautiful. Tell me something. Ask it. Each time I've seen you, you've worn black. It's for my father. He died less than a year ago. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't have to be. You're observant. I like that. It's flattering. In fact, I seem to like everything about you, Race. What would you like to do after dinner? Go home. The butter will have the fire going. And I thought we could just... Talk. The fire was going, as she'd promised. And for the first time in years, I munched freshly roasted popcorn dripping with butter. I love this house, Race. My father left me a fortune, but out of everything, I think I appreciate this house the most. This house and all the things that go with it. Look, these are some linens my mother received when she was married. Aren't they beautiful? She looked unbelievably lovely in the firelight. She gracefully showed me the fabrics, then carefully folded them, placed them on a nearby table. There. It's the last one. Now it's your turn. What would you like to do? Take you in my arms. You think that's going to be hard? Might be the complications. You know, you show signs of being a very domestic young lady. Why don't you kiss me? You'll find I have other qualities, too. <clears throat> I beg pardon, Miss Simpson. Uh, Mr. Graver will see you. I'm just going to barge in, Doris. I, uh... Oh, I didn't know you had company. It's Mr. Race. You remember Winthrop? You met him last night. Oh, yes, yes. Of course I remember. Uh, I came to see you about that youngster. She's been arrested, Doris. Oh. Arrested? Mary Leonard? Well, it seems that Mrs. Barkley made a report to the police about the missing jewelry Oh, and... no. 
We'll have to run down and get the child out. Well, I'm afraid they don't grant bail on a murder charge. Murder? Murder. One of the items the police recovered from the girl was a diamond earring. The mate to it was found today in the apartment of Pharaoh Gillis, along with Miss Gillis's body. So it seems that the orphanage has been harboring a juvenile murderess. <laughs> I saw Mary Leonard the next morning. She had no tears for me. She was terribly quiet, terribly white. I told you no one could do anything for me. Didn't I, Mr. Wraith? Well, I haven't been able to do much, have I, Mary? But I want you to know that I've got an idea about this affair. It's just an idea, and a pretty hazy one at that. But it might lead somewhere. I'll keep in touch with you. The rest of the day, I had Mark out gathering information while I busied myself doing the same thing. We got together at 5 o'clock. Hey, you know something you were right about that Gillis dame? She flipped though around like nothing. And the moolah she give away, I, <laughs> I should have known that lady. Did you visit Mary Leonard? Yeah, yeah, I, I saw the kid. Yeah, Ray, she's scared. She's really scared. They're going to have to let the newspapers in on a deal unless you turn up some. It was about an hour later that I got a call from Doris Sanford. Race, can you come to see me right away? It's important. Trouble? Well, in a way, nothing to do with the orphanage, but it does concern us. Well, let me see. I'm expecting a report on something, but I know what I'll do. I'll call and tell them to get in touch with me at your place. I'll be right over. It's Winthrop Grable, Race. He thinks he's in love with me. And he's become insanely jealous of you. Can't help that, can we? After all, he's a big boy now. But he can hurt you with that column of his. Uh, there's a phone I... call from Mr. Race, Miss Sanford. I took it in the library. It was the report I'd been waiting for. When I got back to Doris, I found Winthrop Grable with her. He greeted me with a frigid nod. His face was flushed. His eyes had a too bright look. Was it the call you've been expecting, Race? Yes. It seems that Pharaoh Gillis not only made a promise to give $50,000 to the orphanage, but she actually delivered the money. What? what are you talking about? Pharaoh Gillis always did everything with cash. And that's the way it was handed over. 50000 in United States currency. I guess it was too much for the party who accepted it, because nothing was ever said about it. And that's why Pharaoh Gillis was murdered. So where do we go from there? To the fact that Pharaoh Gillis wasn't murdered just to keep her silent. Drawers and cupboards had been emptied in the apartment. She'd evidently obtained a receipt for the money, which the killer wanted, and got, I believe. <laughs> and I suppose you know all about the killer's identity, eh? I do know. Who did it, Race? You did, darling. Ah. Uh... I got my lead on that from the way you folded those linens last night. The way I folded the linens? So carefully, so meticulously. In the same way everything was handled in Pharaoh Gillis's apartment... You were disturbed before you could put the things back. But you left everything so neatly piled. You're being ridiculous, Race. I just inherited a fortune from my father. I know. But this afternoon I learned that it wasn't a very liquid fortune. Not much money. So inheritance taxes were going to cripple you. Make you sacrifice a big slice of your holdings. I think the courts will accept that as a pretty good motive. Oh, you're wrong, Race. No, I'm not. The item I particularly don't like is the way you set that little girl up for a patsy. Framing her with some frowsy jewelry. Planting the stuff so she'd not only be suspected of thievery, but of murder as well. Wynne, this man is trying to frame me. Yes, but he's not going to get away with it. Put that gun away, Gravel. She's making a fool of you. No, you've been trying to make a fool of me. Making passes at her when you knew she was engaged to me. But it's the last pass you'll make at any woman. Why, you... Sorry, Gravel. I can only allow you one miss. Oh! Yes. Yes, dear. I've been thinking of taking a trip to Lake Louise. Why don't you come with me? After all, you can't prove I did anything. That receipt is no longer in existence, nor the duplicate. I know. But you wrote pretty heavily when you made it out. Heavily enough to mark up the blank underneath. That was what my report was about. 
The police lab was able to show it all up. The amount and your signature. And you can put down that poker, darling, before I forget I'm a gentleman. <laughs> Adventures of Frank Race, starring Tom Collins with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan, comes to you from Hollywood. Others heard in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Michael Ann Barrett, Jack Crucian, Jack Carrington, and Bert Holland. This series is written and directed by Joel Murcott and Buckley Angel. The music is composed and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again this same time next week for another dramatic chapter in The Adventures of Frank Race. Art Gilmore speaking. This is a Bruce Ells production. Uh-huh.